Today we are taking a look at 16 of my everyday home decor viewer favorites so far from 2021. For this next project, I'm taking one of these mesh baskets from the Dollar Tree. These come in black and white, but I wasn't sure what I was going to be making with this when I bought it. So I bought the white one and ultimately I should have bought the black one. Actually, I don't even think my store had the black one when I bought this. But anyways, we're just going to paint it with a very thin light coat of black paint, any kind of black paint. I'm just using a house paint here because I don't want you to be able to see any of that white with what we're going to do to it. So I'm taking this black um, craft cord that I got from Hobby Lobby. If you saw my macrame video last week, you know I didn't really love this for macrame, but it does work nicely for other projects. So I'm just going to hot glue this around the very bottom of my basket to start and you want to use a very tiny amount of hot glue when you're doing this because of course this is mesh, it is wire, it's just going to go right through there. So I just used the tiniest little amounts and I made sure to push it up all the way to that edge um, so that whenever it's sitting on the floor or on any surface, you're not going to see that wire basket underneath. And this is why I wanted to paint it black so that if there are some little spots where you can see through, you're not going to get that white showing through underneath. It will still be black. So I'm going to take this and wrap it all the way around um, several times. I go maybe like eight to ten rows up with this black. And I learned as I was going that I didn't need to put the hot glue on like every surface that I was putting the, the cord down on. Um, I did start using like less and less glue as I went up. So here you can see I have several rows done. I'm going to cut that off. I ended it at the same place that I started so that this is going to be like the clear back of my basket. And then I'm just taking this tan cord, same style. They're both four millimeter craft cords. And I'm going to butt that right up against where I cut the black one. And we're going to do four rows of this tan color just to give like a little added interest to the basket. And my initial plan for this was to use nautical rope that the Dollar Tree carries. Um, and it's funny because my, my Dollar Tree has had nautical rope for like months and months and months. Every time I go in, I see it. I look at it. I don't pick it up. And then the other day when I went to pick it up for this project, of course, they no longer had it. So oh, I just think it's so funny how the Dollar Tree works sometimes. But this ended up working out just fine it's obviously a lot thinner than that nautical rope is so it took a little bit longer to do but i really love the way this turned out so then i had my four rows is that four maybe it's three oh no it's four rows of the tan on there and then i just go the rest of the way up with my black and when i finish the top of it i'm not going all the way up and like covering that top lip of the basket, I'm going right underneath of that. And you'll see why here in a minute. So what we're making is a little plant stand. So I'm taking this two by four, two foot by four foot board. It's just like plywood that I got from Home Depot. It was like a quarter inch thick and I'm just gonna cut an 11 by 11 inch square to go on top of our basket. And you can see I cut that down before I had added on my cording. But anyways, this is just scrap wood that I had laying around. It was actually something that my son was using to play with his army guys on. And you know, kids, after a week he was over it, didn't want anything to do with it anymore. So now it was my wood, but it worked out for me. So then I'm just gonna take um, my cut piece of wood and I'm going to use my antique Waverly wax and I'm going to do like a combination of brushing it on with my chippy brush and then rubbing it in with my rag because I love the effect that this gives with the chippy brush, but then like some areas might get a little heavy and I'll just wipe it off with my cloth. And you could use any color 
cording that you wanted or rope or yarn or whatever you want on this you don't have to even like stay in the top you could paint it you could do a circle on here instead of a square whatever works for you you can make this your own so then I'm just taking some E6000 and I'm putting it all the way around the top. So this is why I didn't want that cord to go all the way around the top there because then you wouldn't have as tight of a bond with your E6000 and your wood. So you want it to stay on there nice and tight. So then I just set it where it needed to go, push down, um, and then I took some books that I had laying around, put them on top overnight so that it had a nice secure hold. And here's a look at how it turned out. I love how modern and minimal again this looks. And I actually think I would have preferred a circle top instead of the square, but I still think this looks great. What do you guys think? So we're going to be making a lantern here and I am starting out with some of these shadow boxes from Dollar Tree. So I have a small one, I have a medium sized one, and then I have two larger ones. And I'm just going to take off any like embellishments that they have, try to sand it down and get it as smooth as I possibly can to get ready to paint. And at first I started sanding this bunny one to get the glitter off and then I was like, oh wait, just rip the paper off, it comes right off so easily. And then I thought I recorded when I was painting these, but clearly I didn't. Anyways, I just painted them in Mineral by Waverly, and I'm sure you all know how to paint. So next, I had this bag full of shims that my husband had in the garage. And because they're like smaller on one side, thicker on another, I had to glue them together so that I would have one solid piece that was the same with the entire way down but if you had like paint stir sticks or just like scrap wood or anything I did have scrap wood honestly I didn't feel like cutting it down I thought these would be easier um, but you could do that and completely skip this step so once the um, wood glue had dried I just took some wood filler filled in all of those cracks so that this, these would look like one solid piece and then just sanded that down Again, I painted all of these things with Mineral by Waverly. I love this like taupey grayish color. It's so popular right now and I love the way it looks. Um, but then I'm gonna take my shims and I'm gonna glue them in like a 90 degree angle. And I'm gonna also put a bead of hot glue in the center to make sure these are nice and secure. So these are gonna be our corners of our lantern. Next, I'm going to hot glue these in all four corners. So you would need eight stir sticks if that was what you were using or eight pieces of wood or whatever you were using for this. And I'm gonna glue these down to the top and the bottom. I don't know why I didn't paint part of these before putting them in. One of the videos that I had watched where I got my inspiration from, they didn't. So I thought maybe I, I shouldn't. I don't really know what the reason was. I think it was because of like the glue holding things together. It was a little, easier to hold together, not painted. But anyways, it ended up just being an extra step that I needed to do in the end. I've seen so many of these lanterns and I'm gonna show you a few of my favorites that I've seen recently here in a minute. But after you have the top and bottom squares glued on or boxes glued on, then you're gonna take your medium size one, glue it on top right in the center. I just drew a line in the center so I knew where to glue it. Same thing with this smaller one. We're just gonna like stack them up on top of the lantern. I also do add a little finial on top and I don't think I recorded that part either. But now I'm just going back in with my Waverly painting up all of the outside parts that I did not originally paint. And then I thought it was looking a little plain. I was gonna leave it here and then I was like, no, it kind of needs something else. So I took this assorted dowel rods that I have from Walmart and I took the square ones because my lantern is a rectangle. It's more square than it is round. So I'm taking these square ones and I'm going to cut them down to fit on the top and the bottom of my lantern. And I put these about an inch up on both the top and bottom. First, I just cut them down with my miter shears. And like I said, I put these an inch from the top, an inch from the bottom, and I just drew a little line so I knew where the top 
of my dowel rod was gonna go. And I know my head keeps getting in the way here. I love this added detail. It definitely gave it a little something extra. Um, I wanted to make one of those lanterns, those really large lanterns that you see at Hobby Lobby, but those things are like $150. No, thank you. I am not spending that. But here's a look at three of the most recent and ones that I've seen and that I really love that I got inspiration from for this piece. And here's a look at how mine turned out. I absolutely love this. I think this is by far my favorite project on my channel. I just absolutely love the way this turned out. But let me know in the comments which one of these was your favorite and I'll make sure to link all of the inspiration pieces below. Next, I'm taking these wood shims that I got. I picked up a few packs and ended up using a little under two, but I'm gonna split them up into four groups of six shims each. And I'm gonna paint them in these four colors, moss, antique wax, ink, and ivory. So once I had all of my shims painted, I had this like wire wreath form that I broke off of uh, one of the larger Dollar Tree wreath forms a few months ago. And I wanted to make this shim wreath and I used the wire wreath form as just like a guide on how I should place them. And I got all of these shims placed around the wreath. It looked like it was gonna work out perfect. I loved the way it was looking. But as soon as I went to glue them all down in place, it wasn't working like it would not stay in the shape I needed it to it they were like stacking too high on top of each other and I just couldn't figure out how I got it to lay out right but not glue down right it was so weird and I wonder I didn't use the wreath form to actually glue them too and maybe that would have helped but I played with this thing like 500 times and pulled it apart multiple times trying to get it to work so instead I just took this MDF round that I had that came off of a mirror and I'm just gonna use that to glue all of my pieces down to. So I laid out each color and just layered them how I thought they should look. I wanted the green moss color to be the star. So that's why I started with that one down first. Um, I did lay these all out and you can see the glue I had all over these. I tried hot glue. I tried uh, wood glue because I needed a little more time to play with them. It was literally a hot mess. But anyways, it turned out okay in the end. Not exactly what I was hoping for, but I still think it looks pretty good. So once I had those all down, um, I did just hot glue these all in place. And then I flipped it over and painted the MDF round with my ivory chalk paint. And you also could paint this before gluing it. I didn't even know if this was gonna work and I didn't wanna waste my time. So I waited until I knew I was gonna get my wood shims down to start painting my round. But then I thought it was looking a little bare and it needed something to finish off that circle. So I grabbed my jute cord and hot glued that all the way around the edge. This jute cord is from Walmart, so it is a little bit thicker than the jute you would get from the Dollar Tree. So once I had that down in place, I just, of course, grabbed my lighter and burned off all of those little fraying bits on the jute. I think this is so satisfying to watch all of those little fuzzies just burn away. So next I'm taking my welcome sign. This was a galvanized word that was from the Dollar Tree. It came in like a pack of three back in the fall. And I just painted it black with my ink Waverly chalk paint. So this next part, I, I couldn't figure out how I wanted to do. I played around with this so many different times in so many different ways. I started out with like a swag on the top of this wheatgrass, didn't love it, didn't like how it was looking, I thought it was taking away from the shims, so then I just kind of made like a little asymmetrical wrap at the bottom, didn't really love that, like I don't know, this is one of the better options I guess, but still I, I just wasn't loving it. I really wish I could have had my 
shim wreath just like be the hero and work out the way I had wanted it to but that's neither here nor there. So next I grabbed a few other options and played around with. I didn't know what to do. Um, eventually I did end up landing on these blooming branches from the Dollar Tree and I just kind of laid them out in like an asymmetrical pattern and then added a double little jute twine bow to the bottom. I don't know if this is my favorite option. Let me know what you guys think in the comments, but this is what I ended up with and I was so frustrated with this project by the end, I just wanted to get it done. And here's a look at how it turned out. I really love the idea of the shim wreath and like I said, I wish it really would have turned out how I initially had it laid out. I'm gonna have to Play with that one again i do have some more packs of shims so we'll see if i can get it to work in a future video but i ended up placing this on my front door and i do love it there for the springtime that's it for today's video guys let me know what you think of these three wood craft projects wood scrap projects i don't know <laughs> i'll see you in the next one For this last project, I'm taking this large shadow box that I got, again, from the Goodwill. It was $5.99, so I paid $3 for it, or over by a few dollars. It was originally a, um, what is that place called? TJ Maxx? TJ Maxx piece um, that was $30, and it was comparable at $60, so a great deal for such a large shadow box. So the first thing I need to do is get all of this felt backing off because I want to take this piece apart. And this is definitely the most involved project in today's video. Once I had all of that felt backer off, I wanted to remove the plywood backing because we need to remove those little florals and whatnot that's inside of it. I had intended on reusing this backer to as much like my still my background piece but it was pretty beat up and just not very nice shape so I decided not to use that scrap it I had also planned on using the glass but the glass was frosted and I could not get that frosted glass part to come off I tried scraping it I tried acetone nothing was working so scrapped that idea as well and moved on to something totally different from my original plan. So once I had all of the elements removed, I sanded it down in my garage and then I'm taking my ebony stain by, I believe this is a Varathane stain, and I'm just going to stain my entire wood frame. And then I'm gonna let that dry for 24 hours. So I cut down a piece of plywood in my garage that would would fit inside of this frame rather than the beat up piece that it came with. And I just painted it white with my Rust-Oleum white chalk, linen white chalk paint. I didn't think you needed to see that. You already saw me use that paint once. But then I just drew on some shiplap lines there with my T-square and now I'm going to Give it a more distressed, rustic look. Now, distressing is totally a personal preference. I don't personally love a ton of distressing, but I know a lot of people who are into the farmhouse style do. So do as much or as little distressing that you're comfortable with. So I in, went in with my Waverly Antique Wax and then I used that for like my shiplap lines. Then I went over, I thought it was a little too dark. I went over it with my white chalk paint again. And then I started going back and forth with all of my colors. So various shades of brown. I used my Waverly wax, I used fawn, and then I used hazelnut. And then again, I was just taking my white, blending all the colors together, making it all look seamless and pleasing to my eye. Next, I am taking some vinyl decals that I cut out with my Cricut and I spelled Jones Hive. 
So we're gonna make this like a little beehive sign because I absolutely love bees for the spring and summertime. So one mistake that I did here, I should have put my plywood backer up against my frame to see where I should have placed my words because I feel like I did place them slightly too high it looks fine it still looks great but I wish I would have brought them down maybe even like half an inch or so but I just use my L roller here from the Dollar Tree to make sure I get all of my vinyl decals on there nice and straight Next, I just cut out some little honeycomb pieces because of course, if we're having a bee sign, we need to have some honeycombs. And I just found this design right on the Cricut Design Space. I just typed in, I think I just typed in honeycomb or maybe like hexagon, I don't know, something like that, but it was really easy to find. And I'm just gonna cut this up and I, I placed like some larger sections, some smaller sections, and you'll see that here in a second. But I just pulled it off of the backing and put it down like a sticker. I didn't want, I didn't think the transfer tape would have been helpful putting this one down. So I just used it like a sticker and it worked out fine. So once I had that piece down, then I wanted to paint some of the little hexagon honeycomb parts yellow, I did want to give this sign a little pop of color and I think it was much needed. The yellow paint that I have was a very bright yellow. So I did just add in a little dab of black. You can see on my little palette there, I added way too much black at first and had to go back and redo it. But the last little element we need to add for this part of the sign is my B, of course, to complete our hive but don't turn this off just yet, we're not there. We have a few more little add, added details, finishing touches that we wanna add to this sign. So I'm going to take my wood glue, glue my backing plywood background onto my, my sign here. But since this is a shadow box, I want to give it that 3D element. So next I'm taking this chicken wire that I bought from Walmart. And again, I'm just cutting it down to size with some wire cutters. Be very careful, this stuff is very sharp. And then I took some E6000, glued it down to my like shadow box, the portion of the frame, and held it on with some clips to dry. I did not let this dry for 24 hours before moving on to my next step, but I did let it dry long enough to where it was holding in place. So the last little detail that we're gonna add on here is I took a little sponge dabber and I'm taking the color Burnt Sienna, which is like a rusty color, and then um, I'm just dabbing it all over the chicken wire along with some Elephant Gray, which is a dark gray to tone down that silver, and then just a little touch of black because I don't want this to look like new chicken wire or new wire at all. I really don't want it to look like wire. I kind of want it to look like just like a 3D element of the honeycomb beehive. So I definitely wanted to tone down that shininess. And once I had all of my colors on there, I did go in with some Mod Podge and I just glopped it on a couple of the, like various spots, mostly like where the seams were and where the wires twisted together. And then I took some ground cinnamon put it on where the Mod Podge was so that it would have that more like rusty old look and more like 3D element. And I think this just really helped add to this overall aesthetic of this sign. And I just love the way this turned out. I do go in and add one more small little hive section next to the 2015 because I thought it was just missing a little something right there. But let me know what you guys think of this sign. I absolutely love it. For this next project, I'm taking this glass gallon jug that I got from the Goodwill several months ago and I made it over in another DIY video a little while back. So I'll link that in the description box below, but I'm gonna start out by removing all of the embellishments that I previously added to it. 
So then I'm taking these scraps that I had left over from a carpet rug gripper mat that I just put a new rug in my bedroom and these were literally just the scraps left over that I cut off from where they were hanging out from the rug. And I'm going to place these in various spots all around my glass jar. So some of them I cut down thinner to be just like single strips and I just started attaching these all over the all over the jar wherever I thought it looked nice and I used my E6000 to hold this in place. So I did this on, I glued these all down in place on a Friday evening, came back to it Saturday morning and it was good to go. So I didn't give it like a full 24 hours to dry, but it did have several hours. So there is no rhyme or reason to where I glued these pieces down, just wherever I thought it looked nice and just created a unique pattern. And here is how it's looking with all of my rug gripper pad pieces all over the jar. So next I'm taking my ivory chalk paint and some baking soda mixture. Now I know everyone and their mother is doing this technique, but stick with me because this is not what we end up doing. So I do do this part at first. I mix up my paint and baking soda and I start stippling it all over my jar. So I want that texture and I want a lot of texture. So that's why I'm stippling this, even though if you were to just paint this on regularly, you will still get that texture from the baking soda. But here you can see, I know this is the first coat of paint. I do end up doing two, but still wasn't happy with how the rug pieces were still looking like they were not part of the jar. And that's what I was going for. I wanted that cohesive look like it was always meant to be there and that's just how the jar was or the vase or whatever you want to call this thing the vessel i don't know so next i'm taking some lightweight spackle from the dollar tree and i mixed that with my paint and here i'm just spreading it over the um, raised edges and i'm kind of feathering it down and then taking my brush again and stippling over all of that to kind of blend it in and this gave a much better effect and made those rug gripper pieces look like they were part of this vase. And that is what I was going for. So I did have to let this dry for quite a while because it was really thick on there, but here is how it's looking and you absolutely could leave it just like this. I think it is simply beautiful and very modern boho you know, whatever look you're going for. But I wanted to take it a step further and make it look aged. So I took various shades of browns that I had in my stash and I will link all of the colors on the screen here so you know what I used. But I just took some chippy brushes, some sponge dabbers, went all over this vase in various spots because I really wanted those um, raised pieces to stick out the most, but I still wanted this piece to look like it was aged. However, I also wanted it to be light. So I still wanted it to be like a fairly white piece. So after I went in with all of my shades of browns and I did throw in a little gray in there, um, then I took my ivory again and went over the entire piece to blend it all together. And I did this several times back and forth with my browns finish it off with my white until I was happy with the look. And I think this turned out not exactly how I had envisioned, but I still love that aged effect that I got. And this is how it turned out. For my first piece, this is what my inspiration was. So it's like this shell decor modern stand thing. And I am going to take um, some foam core board, trace a large circle and cut this out. So when cutting out foam core board, you wanna make sure you have a very sharp knife so that you don't get any wonky, jaggedy edges and that it's nice and smooth. 
Then I'm going to take a smaller object and do the same thing, cutting out our smaller circle. Next, I'm taking this icing cake decorating kit that I have, and I'm going to take my piping bag because this is what we're going to use to get all of our little circles on to our foam core board. So during my bathroom renovation, my husband bought this giant thing of a joint compound and we didn't even use half of it. So I figured why not come up with some DIYs that I can create using the leftover joint compound. And I have to give a shout out to my friend Brandy at the DIY struggle because she has a whole video on ways that you can use joint compound to create texture on different materials and it is awesome. So I'm gonna link it for you down below. Make sure you check that out because she totally inspired this idea. So next I'm taking my piping bag and we're just going to create the center part just like our inspiration had. So I just put some globs on there and then smoothed it down with my like plastic little spatula here. And then I'm gonna take a comb, just like a hair comb. And that's how I'm gonna get those little lines that you saw in the inspiration image. This worked out perfect. So next I wanna create the little circles and on the inspiration, that one was made out of seashells. I'm assuming it just said shells, so I would imagine those are seashells, but <laughs> I didn't have seashells and this is what I wanted to use anyways. So I just created varying sizes of circles, some smaller, some medium, some larger, and I just filled it all the way around my circle on both sides. And then I had to let that sit around to dry for about a day, I would say it took for this piece to dry. Next, we're going to make our base. I'm taking one of these MDF signs that you can find at the Dollar Tree along with one of their larger dowel rods. And I'm going to paint both of these black. I also cut down, clearly you can see I cut down that board to make it a little smaller. Next, I need to find the center of my board and we're going to drill a little hole so that I can put my dowel rod in there and make it nice and secure. Of course, I got to clean up my space. I love this little vacuum. I will link it down below. It is from Amazon. Then I'm going to take some wood glue, stick my dowel in there, and set it down to dry. So once my sculpture piece is dried, I'm taking like a sanding block and just making sure there's no like really rough spots. And this stuff is really easy to sand, so you can mold it to be however you want. Then I'm going to take my ivory chalk paint and I'm going to paint everything all over. I did the front and the back. And I went in all kinds of different directions to make sure I got into all those little grooves and spaces. Then I'm gonna take my mineral chalk paint and this is like a stencil brush from Target actually, but I love this thing because it's so like frayed that it's perfect for distressing something like this. So I just went back and forth with my mineral and my ivory until I got the look that I wanted. The last little step here is to take our hot glue and attach the foam core joint compound board sculpture to the base. And that's it for this one. This was super easy. So the inspiration cost $60 and mine was free because I had all of these materials on hand. Now mine does look a little bit different, but I used colors that would fit my home decor style. You could use your imagination with this. You could do so many different things. Make it blue if you wanted to make a different design. There are so many ways you could make this your own. All right, so this next one is the most involved project in today's video. So I'm taking this wood scrap wood piece that I had in my garage. It's just plywood. Um, and I'm staining it with this Varathane sun bleached stain. It's like a grayish color. When I bought it, I actually thought it was more of like a whitewash, but it's definitely more gray. So I really wanted that wood tone to come through. So I wiped off the stain immediately after putting it on so that you could really see that variation and the green come through. Next, I'm taking this plastic container. This was actually like a whey protein container and I'm going to cut it in half. Um, this was actually very, very thick plastic and was pretty difficult to cut. It took me quite a while. Had to have my husband help me for a little bit of it because that bottom was just so thick to try and get through. But I'm using this as a mold and 
Hindsight's 2020, I really could have just used this itself and painted it, but I had this um, quick creep concrete that I had left over from another project and I've been wanting to use it again. So I thought this would be the perfect thing to use it on. I've been wanting to make like a 3D sign. I saw one at um, Dollar General that was of a, what are those things called, watering can that had like flowers coming out of it. So that was my inspiration for this piece. So I just ended up mixing up some concrete and then I'm going to use my little plastic container there as my mold. So you definitely want to make sure you spray the inside of your mold really well. Listen, I just used olive oil and that worked fine, um, but you don't want it to stick. You don't want the concrete to like stick to your mold and then you won't be able to get it out. So I'm just adding in uh, my cement mixture here and I just started like building it up on the sides. At first I was going to take the second half of this mold and press it on top to stay there but I didn't like how that was kind of looking. So I just used my fingers and I didn't have an issue with that. It stayed in place just fine so I just kept building it up where I needed to. I made the edges like about a half an inch thick and just like smoothed it out as I went along and I think this worked out so great. To be able to attach this to my wood, I'm taking these butterfly anchors um, that my husband told me would work and it worked perfectly. So I'm just taking the bolt part and sticking it down into that cement and then I built the cement up a little bit around it so that it would be nice and secure in there. You do want to make sure these are perfectly straight. Um, I did have to go back and kind of play with them a little bit. Um, so that it can go into your wood nice and even and you're not having to like fuss with it too much. But then I, whenever this dried, I let it set for 24 hours and then popped it out of my mold. It was really easy to come out and here's what it's looking like. I wish I would have built up that um, top rim a little bit more, but I still think this looks so good. So next I'm just drilling the holes into my plywood where I need those bolts to go through to attach to my wood piece. So I did end up having to like play with this a little bit. It didn't work perfectly the first time, um, but after a few tries it went in and then I just secured the butterfly bolt to the back. And I forgot to record that part. So I did just hold up a clip of it here. This is what it looks like on the back once that butterfly anchor is attached. So next I wanted to add in my words. So I cut out welcome to our home with my Cricut machine and totally not thinking that when you have stained wood, you need to add in a top coat or a sealer or Mod Podge or something because vinyl is just not going to stick to that. Totally wasn't thinking, totally forgot about that step. And you're gonna see right here that my vinyl is not gonna do anything. I should have known whenever it started to come up as soon as I took my roller off, but no, I didn't think. <laughs> Here you can see it literally just came right off. So then I just grabbed my Mod Podge, put a layer down just where I wanted my words to be. This is just matte Mod Podge and you couldn't even see that I had only put it in one little spot in the end. But once that dried, then I was able to add in my vinyl decals and it worked out just fine. And yes, I know my T is missing there. He did not want to stick to my transfer tape, so I just put him on separate. Once I had all of my vinyl on, I just took various paint colors because I thought the cement was looking a little too light. I wanted it to look a little more aged and more rustic. I really don't think I achieved the look I was going for, and I don't know if it was because of the the texture of it was this cement. I've never really tried to make cement look aged before, um, but I played around with like some dark and light shades of gray. I had my antique wax. I ended up putting some black in there. I was trying to blend it all together, trying to like make the cracks stand out more and make them have more depth. Long story short, it was not working and I hated the way it looked. So I just went over the entire thing with my mineral chalk paint, which is like a light grayish color. And I think because of everything underneath of it, it ended up working out just great. Like look how terrible that looks right there. It looks so bad. 
But to create a border around this, I just took some garden stakes that you can find. I, you can find them a lot of places this time of year. I got them from the Dollar General. And I just stained those with my antique Waverly wax and glued them down to my board. Next, I'm taking this flexible stencil that I got from the Dollar Tree and I just taped off the areas I didn't want to stencil down and I'm just going to take my antique Waverly wax and use my stencil. I created a row of this little flower and polka dot across the top and across the bottom of my little mason jar here. So to save time and to not make this video too crazy long, the next step I did was just add in some florals and a jute bow and that was it for this one. I think this turned out so great. It's not my favorite. It didn't turn out exactly how I had envisioned, but the idea was there. So I definitely want to try this one again. Let me know what you guys think of this one in the comments. Next, I have this so cute, tiny little end table, I guess it is, entry table. I don't know what you would call this, little side table. But my neighbors were throwing it away and I ran outside to grab it. My husband told me it was sitting out there. He's like, look what they're getting rid of. And no, 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 they're not getting rid of that thing. I'm gonna take it and I'm gonna flip it. So um, the first thing I had to do was kind of clean it up. It was very dusty, gave it a little scuff sand, and then I'm going to paint this whole thing with my same Waverly Green Moss chalk paint. I'm not going to make you watch that whole thing, but I am using a zebra brush here. I wanted to let you guys know as well, I love these brushes. They are fantastic for different areas of your home. This is actually one that I used when I painted my windows in my house, and that thing is amazing. So next I'm just taking off the top. I probably should have taken this thing apart before I painted it, but it really didn't matter in the end. So next I'm taking this little Chevron stencil. This was a three pack from Walmart. Um, it had like three different design sheets in it, but there was like six different designs. So I'm just going to take my ivory chalk paint here, dab on my little stencil, and we're just going to bring this little old table up to the current century that we're in. So just like I did in that first DIY, we are going to overlap the stencil where it ended so that we get that seamless look. Like I don't want to try and guess where that next little piece should be once it ended and the stencil didn't fit across the whole piece. This is just so much easier. I also did do the bottom shelf and I wanted to show you the same thing that I did there. I matched up that bottom chevron line on the top row and then also on this, <coughs> excuse me, on the side and that looks perfect. Like you wouldn't even be able to tell that this was just a little piece of a stencil that I kept putting on over and over. It looks so good, I love it. And my husband has claimed this as his key spot. At first he wanted me to sell it, but now he's kind of partial to it because now he actually knows where he leaves his keys every day. <laughs> he is always losing those things. But this is my exact boho look and I love it. project today is going to be this vintage looking birdcage and I'm starting out taking this wire hanging planter basket from the Dollar Tree and I'm just going to remove that hanging wire part, the hook, yeah the hook that's what it is <laughs> and set that aside because we don't need it. Next up I'm just going to take some foam core board, trace out my circle and cut that out and I'm going to use all of these paints to give a faux wood look to my foam core board circle that we cut out. So first I'm taking the color mineral and I am covering the entire foam circle. Now I'm, if you are familiar with peppermint cactus, she does some amazing foam core board projects and I've only watched like one or two of her videos. I'll link her channel below, but she has some fantastic 
um, methods, I guess you would say, for making foam board look like faux wood and other things. Um, so I just kind of took that inspiration and layered on all of these different tones of browns until I was happy with the look that I got. So again, I am just layering on each of these different colors while the paint is still wet and I'm also using the same brush. I was going to use different brushes for each color, but I realized it was probably better to get that true blended faux wood look using the same brush. And I think this turned out so amazing and I want to try this on other materials. While I wait for this paint to dry, I am taking these longer dowel rods that you can find at the Dollar Tree. Along with this hula skirt, you can also find at the Dollar Tree with their summer decor. So I'm going to take one dowel rod, line it up with each of these metal wire parts on our hanging planter. I'm gonna hot glue that in place. Now I know that hot glue and metal do not get along very well, so that is where our hula skirt is going to come in handy. The hot glue did help hold it in place long enough for me to be able to take the hula skirt, pull off a couple of strands, and then wrap it around my dowel and that wire piece. I wrapped it around maybe six times and then hot glued it in place, and these dowels are not going anywhere. I just repeated this process all the way around my wire basket. Next, I wanted to glue the dowel rods down to the foam core round circle. And the way I got this to work, because you can see that those dowels are sticking out farther than where the foam core board is, they're not exactly straight up and down. So I started with opposing sides. So I glued one side, turned it around 180 degrees, glued the other side, and then I did like the opposing sides again. I hope that makes sense. And then I went around and glued everything in between. So once I had that all glued down and it worked out just fine, nothing popped off. It all stayed in place where I wanted it. Now I'm taking some wooden beads and this is a part I didn't entirely think through before I just started gluing them down. So I wanted to put the larger beads all the way around, but they wouldn't really fit in between all of my spaces. So I had to grab just like random sizes and just use whatever would work. And I have like some smaller ones, some medium ones, some bigger ones, and there is absolutely no rhyme or reason to how they're sitting around the edge. And I think it actually gave it a pretty unique look but it definitely wasn't what I had intended to or intended to do originally. So once I had all of that figured out, I'm just taking my ivory chalk paint and I gave all of the wooden beads and the dowels one coat of paint. And then I gave the black wire basket two coats. So I was okay with some of that brown or wood tone showing through a little bit on the wooden pieces. Next, I'm just going to dry brush again. So I'm taking some mineral, some of the fawn, and some of the antique Waverly wax. And similar to what I did on the foam core board, I am just, well, this time I'm dry brushing. And I'm just going around all of the wooden beads, everything that I just painted white to give a distressed look. And once I was happy with that, I took some nautical rope from the Dollar Tree and I'm gluing this around the bottom to cover up the, that the bottom of the dowel rods, that foam core board, and like any hot glue that was seeping out on the bottom of the beads.
Next I'm taking these little, I don't even know what these are, like little fruit dishes you can find from the Dollar Tree. They're plastic. They are in like the cookware section maybe or the glassware section. And I'm just doing the exact same process that I did to all of the wood parts, giving it that distressed look and then adding this little finial guy right on top. Next, I'm taking some jute cord, wrapping it around that top, and then I glue this on top of my little bird cage. I was completely out of frame for that, so I just didn't even show it. Then I'm, for the last step, you could have left it there. I actually did, and then the next day I was like, no, it's kind of still missing something. So I grabbed some more jute cord and wrapped it all around the dowels and that wire frame just to give it a little added detail, and I think this was the perfect finishing touch. And I also added one more row of the jute cord around the bottom and then burned off all of the little fraying bits. And that was it for this one. Here is how it turned out. I absolutely love this. It turned out better than I had envisioned it to and I am just absolutely in love with this. You could style this in so many different ways. You could add some candles to the bottom, add some greenery, add some florals. You don't have to be so literal as I was and put some birdhouses in there. I think I will end up changing this up, but I just think it is perfect for now. Next up, we have this boho style wall hanging and I just love the colors in this piece. So I have this wire wreath form. Is it a wreath form? I don't know, wire hoop that I got from the Dollar Tree and it just has this welcome word across the center of it. So I took my wire cutters and just snipped it right off and it came off pretty easily. For that second one, I just twisted it around a few times and that snapped it off. I don't know why I didn't use my wire cutters there. I mean, I had them sitting right there. But anyways, then I'm taking this metallic spray paint. It is in a antique brass color and just spray painted my hoop. While that's drying, I am picking out my yarn colors. So I ended up going with that light tan color, the camel color, that green, and then also black and white. I was debating on the navy, but I didn't end up liking that. I liked the green a little bit better instead. So then I'm just gonna cut down all of my yarns, and I cut way too many because I had a different plan when I started this, um, but I just cut them to about four feet each. And then I took my white, the tan and the camel color and I started making a braid. So you'll see here that I have two of each color there, but I ended up redoing that with only one strand of each color because this ended up being a little bit too thick. Once I had all of my yarns cut, I'm just going to start looping them through my hoop. So this particular hoop has that hanger on the back of it, the metal one, and it is like welded onto that. So I just used it to my advantage for the center of my wall hanging and I put my first strand through that hanger on the back. So I'm going to show you several times and get very close on exactly what I'm doing, but I want you to see, see it first before I try to explain it, I guess. So we're going to start wrapping the yarns around the bottom as well to create a second knot so that these stay in place. So the way that I am creating this, I'm taking my strand, I separated them at the bottom after I created my lark's head, and then I am wrapping it around one side, wrapping it around the next side, and then pulling the end of the string through that loop. Don't worry, I am going to show you this several more times and I'm gonna get real nice and close for you. But I started out with my white strands and I added three of these and then I moved on to adding on my braided piece and it's just one of the braid. And I'm gonna do the same thing here, create my lark's head knot at the top, put my strands underneath of my hoop. <laughs> I think I do it backwards there. Maybe not. Okay, anyways, I don't know what I did there, but here you can see I'm creating my lark's head knot. So you wrap your, pull your strings through the loop that you put 
underneath of the wire form and then pull that tight. I know I just explained that's super weird, but there are so many other videos on how to create a lark's head knot. It is the simplest macrame knot. So then you take both of the ends of your string and you put them underneath of the wire hoop. And then we're going to separate them. So now I'm taking the end and I'm wrapping it around the hoop on the left side of my stationary strand and I'm just gonna loop it around and pull it tight. Then I'm taking that same end and I'm pulling it around the right side, but this time I'm gonna pull the end of my yarn through that loop that we just created and this is what is going to create that knot at the bottom of your wall hanging. I don't even know what that knot is called. I'm sure there's a technical name for it. But I'm gonna to continue to do this adding on my green strings and then I'm going to add on a set of my black. So I have three white, one of the braid, and then three of the black. So once I have those on, now we're gonna move on to the other side. And this time I'm going to start with my black and we're gonna work our way backwards. And that's what's going to give us that kind of design. And I am just putting my black strand just straight over, crop, over top of that first set that we made. And it's just going to create a little diagonal. I'm going to add on three more of my black strands and then go on to my green. And this time I am going to add some beads on to the green strand, the very first green strand. And these are 10 millimeter beads and I just string them along until I get to the very bottom. And I did want to make sure this was nice and tight so that my beads were not going to sag from being a little bit heavier. And then I'm just going to do the same thing at the bottom, creating my knot, but this time I'm making sure that that, that one is super tight just so that my beads don't start to sag. And then I'm just going to work my way backwards, adding my green, adding my braid, and then adding my white. Once all of my yarns are added to the hoop, I just take a dowel rod, a really long one that I just had laying around, and I held it up to create a diagonal so I know where I want to cut my strings. I did skip over the braids because I wanted to tie the knot a little bit higher so that I could just cut it off at the knot. And that was it for this piece. It was actually really easy, even though I know I explained it a little bit complicated, I'm sure, but it really was not hard at all to create. And it only took me about maybe 20 minutes once I had all of my yarns cut. That was the most time consuming part. Up, I have this beautiful Queen Bee decoupage shutter. So I found these shutters actually on the side of the road. Someone down the street from me is cleaning out their house, getting ready to sell it, and has been putting a bunch of stuff out on the curb for free. So I scooped these up and I actually got two sets of them. I only want to use half of one of the sets of shutters, so taking my screwdriver, I just took the hinges off so that I could separate these out. Then I took my crud cutter because this thing was absolutely filthy and gave it a really good cleaning. Once it was all clean, I just took my palm sander. There were several layers of built up sand, or sand, oh my goodness, built up paint over the years. So I at least wanted to sand it down to a smooth surface. And then taking this heirloom white satin Rust-Oleum spray paint, I gave it two good coats.
Next comes the fun part. So I got this Queen Bee decoupage paper from the Farmhouse Market Etsy shop. I will link that in my description box below, but I wanted to try a different method of decoupage that I've never done before, and that is the iron-on method. So what you want to do here is take your Mod Podge, cover your whole surface with a good coat of the Mod Podge, and then you want to let it dry. So once I laid my Mod Podge down, I let that dry completely, and then taking my iron with no steam, I'm going over all of the flat surfaces of my shutter with that decoupage paper laid down on top. You want to make sure that you have some wax paper laid down in between your iron and your decoupage paper so that you don't burn the surface. And I did get a little rip there, but that's okay in the end you can't even tell. Now to get the shutter parts, my iron was not going to fit on all of these. It wasn't a flat, smooth surface. So I just took my X-Acto knife and started cutting slits all through my decoupage paper so that I would have little strips that I could then seal down. And the way I did this was just taking my heat gun and I heated up that glue the same way you would have done with an iron and then just took this little, um, this is actually like a mod, it came with my Mod Podge like roller. So I assume it is for like decoupaging and smoothing out your paper or whatever material you are using. I did end up burning or like melting this thing a little bit because it's not silicone, it is rubber. So you wanna be careful there. The heat gun gets really hot, but this ended up working out really well. So I just continued to do that all the way along my shutter and including these little um, detail lines that were on the outside little part of my movable shutter pieces. I have no idea what you would call those things, but you know what I'm talking about. So once I got all of my paper attached, I just took a 220 grit sandpaper and started sanding down the edges, just making sure to sand down and away from my paper so that I didn't lift up anything that I didn't want to. I was going for a rustic look with this piece, so I did also take some sandpaper and rough up all of the little individual shutter pieces along with all of the edges. And for this one, I took a one, or no, yeah, a 100 grit sandpaper just to make it a little rougher. Next up, I am taking some antique Waverly wax and just going over the entire piece. I know we spray painted this in the beginning and we're kind of just covering all of that up, but I did want to have a nice, clean, smooth surface to start with, and then taking my wax and just adding in all of that aging detail everywhere that the paint is showing. Once I was happy with the distressing, I just grabbed my hinges, attached the two sides of the shutters back together, and I did end up distressing the hinges with some antique Waverly wax as well. And that was it for this piece. It really was not too difficult to do, and I really did enjoy the heat transfer or iron-on method of doing decoupage. I will definitely use this method again in the future. For project number two, I got this bread box. It was from the Goodwill for $4.99, and um, it just opens up. There is a little crack on the inside of it where the bottom of it would have been. Nothing that we can't fix. So I took it out to my garage, gave it a good scuff sand, and this image on it was actually like a raised image if you rubbed your hand across it. So I had to sand that part down really well or else you would have seen it through the paint once we painted it. 
So to fix that little crack, I'm just using my medium Starbond glue along with an accelerator. This is not the Starbond accelerator, but it works just the same. So I'm just going to fill in this crack and then I dropped my camera when spraying the accelerator. So I didn't get that part, but you just spray it on and it instantly hardens. Next, I took this lightweight spackle from the Dollar Tree just to smooth out those cracks so that it wouldn't still be visible. I took some 220 grit sandpaper, sanded that down, and then using my little handy dandy tabletop vacuum, cleaned that all up. And I will link him in my description box below. So to paint this, I am using my moss colored Waverly chalk paint. I did paint the entire outside and then the, the lid, both the inside and the outside of the lid in this color, giving it two coats. I did not paint the inside because we're gonna do something different there. So I found this adhesive stencil vinyl at Michael's. It was on clearance, so I picked it up. I'd wanted to try something like this. I could tell as soon as I opened this, it was going to be a mistake. Like, just look at those wrinkles. I did try to smooth them out with my little, um, why can't I think of that? Like that little brayer tool <laughs> scraper from Cricut. And I lifted it up off of the surface and tried to smooth it back down the best I could. My machine just ate this thing up. I didn't get a clip of that, but don't buy this stuff. The mat and it ripped off part of my backer. So I'm gonna go ahead and say this is a fail of a product and no wonder it was on clearance. So instead I went back to my Dollar Tree contact paper. This is what I like to use whenever I'm printing out a stencil on my Cricut because I'm just gonna end up throwing it away and I don't wanna use expensive vinyl. So I cut out this little paw print and then my dog's name, which is Sarge, because we are turning this little bread box into a dog toy box. So stinking cute. But I've had some people ask me to share my design space process um, using my Cricut. If anyone else is interested in that, let me know. I'm happy to create that for you guys. I'm not a Cricut affiliate, so I just haven't made a video dedicated to my like Cricut design space yet, but I can certainly do that. Just let me know if anyone else is interested in seeing it. Using my makeup sponge, I added two thin layers of white chalk paint to um, my stencil and then used my heat tool to dry it and lifted it off and how cute I just love his little name at the bottom right corner of his toy box <music> For the paw prints, I am placing those on the inside of the lid. So I'm using this a little bit different. I'm having the lid actually be like the top of how the box opens. And you'll see that here in just a minute. So to fill the inside, I decided I wanted to use some fabric to line it with. I had this fabric left over from my bench in my living room. I'll insert a picture of that for you guys to see, but I thought it would be a perfect accent for the inside of his box. And knowing that he's going to be putting his toy, like pulling his toys out of it, I'll be putting them back in, but that he'll be pulling them out of it all the time. I wanted something that would hold up and didn't want to just put paint. So I am using some decoupage glue. This is a terrible angle, so I didn't film too much of this part of the project, but you can get the idea. I just decoupage, mod podge, whatever you want to use. I added this fabric down, cut off anything that was extra, and this I think is going to hold up really nicely with some wear and tear from a dog. So here is how it turned out and I just think this is absolutely adorable. I had been looking for a bread box to make over for a while now and I'm so happy I found one but I do have a true bread box in my kitchen so I wanted to turn it into something else. Sarge, what's in here? What's in here? Is that your toys? Do you like it? What's in there? Yeah, get your toys. Which one are you gonna pick? Oh, oh, one on the bottom. Do you pick the raccoon? You got your raccoon? <laughs> Hard to film. It's a war, huh? Yeah. It's hard to film. He is just so handsome.
first I'm taking my Starbond um, super glue and I started gluing four blocks together to make a long row. Um, my Starbond glue didn't really hold these together too well. It was more like absorbing into the wood. So I do end up switching over to my hot glue and using the Gorilla hot glue sticks and that worked out just fine. I did want a bit more of a secure hold, but this ended up working out just fine for this project. And you're gonna wanna make 40 sets of four blocks each to create this project. So I'm taking this drum lampshade. It's a five inch lampshade that I got from Facebook Marketplace. I believe I got it for about $6. And then I'm also taking this embroidery hoop, which I got from Hobby Lobby. And this is a 10 inch size embroidery hoop. First, I'm gonna take just a scrap piece of wood from my garage, place the lampshade on top, and then separating the embroidery hoops, I placed one on the bottom. Then we're gonna start taking our tumbling tower block sticks, is what I'm gonna call them, <laughs> and we're gonna start placing them around the lampshade and around the embroidery hoop. So I started out with one um, like on all four sides so that I could get everything attached. Again, I am just using my Gorilla hot glue stick. And here is an image of what we're actually making. It's a Scandinavian inspired um, lamp shade. And they use more like um, paint stir sticks or like thin scrap wood. But I thought this would be really cool to make with the tow tumbling tower blocks or Jenga blocks, whichever you would like to call them. So I started hot gluing them both to my lampshade and then also to the bottom part of the embroidery hoop. For this second embroidery hoop, I did cut off a small portion of it so that it would be the same exact size as my first embroidery hoop because the second one's always a little bit larger. But I'm gonna flip my lampshade upside down now and we're gonna place that second embroidery hoop on the bottom just like we did the first one and we're gonna repeat that same process. So we're gonna start taking our tower block sticks and we're gonna place them right up against the ones that we had first attached and do the same thing, attaching them to both the lampshade and to the embroidery hoop, just using our hot glue. And again, this worked out just fine. I don't know that this will hold up for long-term use, especially with this being a lamp, but we'll see. It's gonna, it's gonna work just fine for a decorative purpose. So here I am just going back and forth, placing all of my sticks around. And every time I got to, I would place my sticks going one direction, flip my lampshade over, place them going the opposite direction. And this really did not take long at all to create. all of my block sticks glued down in place I am taking this Hema Ikea lamp cord kit I'm not really sure what these are even called or how to pronounce Ikea names I think we all struggle with that but just attaching this to my lampshade and that's it for this project I absolutely love how this turned out now the one I was inspired by on Pinterest was a lot larger but I really love the size of this one that I made. It's still fairly large. If you think about it, a 10 inch embroidery hoop is still pretty big, but I have this hanging over top of my desk in my living room and I just absolutely love the little accent. For my first project today, I'm taking this shadow box that I found from the Goodwill. It was $2.99, and let me tell you guys, I'm a little disappointed. My Goodwill has changed their pricing structure, and everything is a little bit more expensive now. Let me know if you've noticed the same thing in your area. But what I'm going to do first is take the back off of this, unscrew everything. I don't want that glass piece that came in this, so I'm just removing that, and I'm going to use keep that cardboard backing. 
Next, I'm going to paint my frame using my ivory chalk paint, and I did end up giving this three coats to really cover up that burgundy colored frame. To cover up those florals on the backing, I am taking this Crafters Square cardstock. It is white and it does have a little texture to it. And then using my Jot Dollar Tree brand glue stick, I am going to adhere the cardstock paper down. I love using this glue stick method for something like this instead of Mod Podge where I just simply need this to be a nice plain background. Once I have my cardstock attached to my cardboard <laughs> and I'm going to take my X-Acto knife and cut off the excess. And I'm just going to repeat that process for the second half and don't worry about that seam, you're not even going to see it. Next I'm taking some Jenga blocks along with my Star Bond super glue and I am attaching one in each of the corners and then I also add four into the center area of the inside part of my shadow box because I want that backing to sit up a little bit higher and further away from the front than it originally was. And I also use my Starbond super glue to attach that cardboard piece to the Jenga blocks themselves. And I did not end up screwing this piece back in. Now comes the fun part. I am just taking various sizes and flower types, and I'm going to start arranging them throughout this shadow box. I really love these skinned florals and just like the added dimension that they gave to this piece. Most of what I used here were from the mini assortment and then I did add in just a few of the medium sizes from the bag that I had purchased on my own because I wanted there to be a nice difference in sizes as well as the flower types. Once I was happy with the arrangement, I started taking my hot glue gun and just picking up a small section of the flowers, gluing those down in place, and then moving on to the next section so that I wouldn't forget where I had everything laid out. Once everything was glued down in place, I am taking the sawtooth hangers that came on the original piece and I'm adding some E6000 to the edges ends of them so that I can make sure they, the hanger is nice and secure in place and it will not just pop right out. And here's how this one turned out. I absolutely love the neutralness of this piece. If you've been watching me for a while, you know I love my neutral home decor. The way I added the sawtooth hangers on the back, you could hang this piece vertically like I have here, or you could also hang it horizontal. I really love the vertical look of it, and this could fit in any small space. It will be available on my website, which is linked in my description box below. I am taking this Dollar Tree vase along with some Dollar Tree nautical rope. This is the nine and a half foot nautical rope and I use almost three pieces. We are going to start attaching the nautical rope around the vase using some hot glue. This is such an easy project. Now I know that hot glue and glass do not get along. They are not friends, but as I go around, I attach that very bottom row to the glass itself because I needed something to adhere it to. But then as we move up to the next row and everything after that, I add the hot glue so that it is touching mostly the nautical rope. A little bit of it is on the glass as well, but we are mostly attaching the rope to itself for each layer. And we're just going to continue repeating this process all the way around, all the way up the glass vase. 
whenever my um, strands of rope end, I do make sure to end them all in the same exact spot so that they can all be on the back of the vase. And I don't know why I didn't show you guys that part. As I get to the top, I am going up above that glass rim of the vase by like one line. That way you can't see the glass. Then I'm going to cut my nautical rope off at an angle and we're going to hot glue that kind of down inside of the vase and you can see what I'm doing here. So I didn't realize this until it was too late, but apparently I had two different styles of nautical rope. It does bother me a little bit, but there's nothing I can do about it. It is too late to change it now, so it is what it is. Next I'm taking a lighter and singeing off all of those little fraying fuzzy bits off of the nautical rope. This part is certainly optional. If you like that more rustic look, by all means, leave it the way it is. So what we are doing with this vase is turning it into an adorable beehive. I absolutely love bees. So I just grabbed a votive candle holder, used that for my circle shape, outlined it with a Sharpie, and I'm filling it in with my black Waverly chalk paint. I didn't think the black Waverly chalk paint was dark enough after it dried, so I do go back over it with my Apple Barrel acrylic paint just to give it a more deep black and rich look. Next, I'm taking one of the leftover pieces of nautical rope and we are going to outline that black circle so that it looks like the opening to our beehive. And for a last little detail here, I wanted to make it look like there was honey dripping out of that beehive opening. So I'm taking my mini hot glue gun and I just start pouring on the hot glue or pumping on the hot glue and then I let it drip. Once it starts to drip and I'm happy with the way it's starting to look, I tilted it back, let it cool, and then I repeated that process a few times until I was happy with the way the honey looked. And then I just added in a little bit of lavender floral and that was it for this one. Let me know what you guys think of this in the comments. I know this is not an original idea. This has been done before, but it is so cute and so fun for summer decor. I'm recreating these restoration hardware olive jars. This is more of an inspired by than a true dupe, but close enough. I know this portion is completely out of focus, which I didn't realize until editing. So bear with me it is only a very small portion of this project. I found these two vases at the Goodwill. They were $3.99 each and they were the perfect texture to recreate this project. So I started out by painting both of them with my ivory colored chalk paint. And then I am going to create the baking soda mixture using hazelnut and then my baking soda. I have tried this method a few times now and I'm really not a fan of it. I much prefer to use either joint compound or spackling as a texture additive rather than the baking soda. But I gave it one more shot. So I did just start by stippling this color all around my jar using a chippy brush and I started going down maybe like three rows and just kind of gradually fading it. Then I started taking my ivory color again and going back and forth with both that hazelnut mixture and the ivory, I just started creating a gradient so that it was starting to get lighter and lighter as I went down the vase. I know you can see a gray color off to the side there. I don't mention it because I didn't end up using that color at all. All I used was the hazelnut baking soda mixture and then the ivory. And I'm doing the same thing on the top and the bottom of both of these vases, just gradually fading it and making it look like a gradient. This is the same process we have used all throughout this video of just going back and forth and playing around with your colors back and forth until you are happy with the result. 
And last for this project, I took a piece of my sponge in that hazelnut color, and then I just started dabbing it all over, mostly on the high points, and then also in some random spots here and there. And that was all I did for this one. So here's a look at mine, $7 compared to the member version of $296 for the small olive jar from Restoration Hardware. If you are not a member, you are paying over $300, almost $400. So let me know what you think of this inspired by piece. That's all I got for you today, friends. I'll see you in the next one.